Haworth Boys is the founder and interim CEO of Harvest Plus in the US. He's currently in US, sitting in Efbury, but normally he's in Los Banos, and he's joined us from there. Howdy, as he's known to his friends, is the World Prize Laureate for biofortification. We heard from Dr. Swami Nathan by video. This is following the tradition. Howdy, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So thank you for this opportunity to speak. I, I see my job as, as setting the stage, understanding what the problem is uh, to which the innovations uh, need to be applied. So if I can, are my slides up? There we go. So um, it's appropriate that uh, we had the video by Professor Swaminathan. This is the slide that I've shown for many years on the effects of the Green Revolution. The blue bar shows that the population doubled between 1965 and 1999. We knew that was coming, and we weren't sure we could feed everyone. So we had the Green Revolution, and the orange bar shows what happened. We had uh, we, the supplies of rice and wheat and maize grew faster than population growth, and we avoided widespread famine. But what I want in the context of this conference on malnutrition, I want, to, I want to draw your attention to the green bars. And that's pulse production, but it's just a holder for vegetables, fruits, uh, pulses, uh, animal and fish products. We didn't have the same productivity increases for the non-staple foods. And they're the ones that, ha that, are, that are rich in minerals and vitamins. And this is one of the reasons the primary reason I feel why we have so much mineral and vitamin deficiencies in developing countries. So I'm trained as an economist, so I want to look at what happened to food prices. And this is what happened to cereal prices. These are data for India over a 40-year period. You can see that the cereal prices in India fell at the beginning after the modern varieties were introduced, they fell by 40%. And they stayed low over two, three decades. Now they've been be beginning to go back up a little bit. Uh, but they, they still are at the same level as they were in the 1970s. But here's the kicker, this slide. OK, non-staple food prices for all these different food groups that are supposed to supply minerals and vitamins uh, to keep people healthy, you can see that those prices have been rising steadily over 40 years because we haven't had the supply increases for the non-staple foods. So to provide dietary quality to the poor uh, is getting harder and harder and harder over time. So this is, this is our challenge. How do we, how do we reverse these, these price increases? Now, it's, it's much easier to find data for Asia, for India. These are, these are some data that I was able to find for Africa and a study on Ethiopia that was done by IFPRI researchers. But you see exactly the same patterns. The bars that go to the right, the ones where the prices are increasing over time, are for the non-staple foods. And the bars that go to the left that are decreasing are for the staple foods. So the calories are getting more and more affordable, but the minerals and vitamins are getting more and more expensive over time. So this is, this is the problem that we need to address. So this is just a simple, simple diagram of, I think, what this conference, a large part of this conference is all about. If the area of both those rectangles are the, the total mineral and vitamin requirements, currently the area in green that's being provided by agriculture isn't filling up the whole rectangle. It isn't providing enough. There is not enough food in the world. So, some people say there's enough food in the world, it's just not distributed equally. That's not true. It may be true for cereals, but it's not true for the non-staple foods. We need, over time, we need to increase that green area. We need to get agriculture to produce a much higher percentage of the minerals and vitamins we need. It's much more cost efficient. It's much more sustainable than providing supplements and fortification. So this is a, this is a typology. When I, when I think of these problems and trying to 
categorize uh, different types of interventions that we need to have, I, I think of this four by four matrix. So the rows are the staple foods and the non-staple foods. And again, I've emphasized that it's the non-staple foods that are naturally high and dense in bioavailable minerals and vitamins. And then the two, the two columns have to do with behavior change. And at the risk of um, uh, generalizing, I, I think of the indirect behavior change, and that tends to be what, how economists approach problems, and the direct behavior change, which I tend to think of as the way that nutritionists approach problems. I think we need, we need a mix of both. So what do I mean by indirect? We know as economists that when the price goes up, the demand goes down. So when the price goes up, you eat less of that food, whether it's good or bad for you. That's behavior change. You change your behavior, you're reacting to prices. But it's already in your behavior. When the price goes up, you demand less. So it's an indirect approach to changing behavior. When your incomes can go up, you buy more of various items at different rates. It's an indirect way of, of motivating you to change your behavior. Whereas with, with direct behavior change, you're providing nutrition education, you're telling people you need directly to change your behavior. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't work. And, it, and we, have to, we have to understand what combination of indirect behavior change and direct be behavior change is the most efficient way of approaching. So I've, I've given some examples in each one of the cells of the, um, of the matrix. So things like, uh, so of course, I've, I've been involved in biofortification, which is putting more minerals and vitamins in the staple foods. So I've, my work is concentrated on that first row. For some, of the, for some of the crops for iron and zinc, you can't see it, you can't taste it. We just piggyback on the highest yielding varieties that are coming out of agricultural research centers. And over time, we're, we, the philosophy is that over time, we can capture 100% or close to 100% of the total supply over a long period of time. Why do farmers adopt the varieties? Because they're high yielding, because they're most profitable. And that's an indirect. We know that farmers react to, to profit incentives. We don't have to change their behavior. They already behave that way. But some of our crops are, are high in vitamin A and we change the color. So in that case, we have to change behavior. We have to, we have to explain, quit eating the white, white variety and start eating the orange variety. It's just as high yielding. So by the same token, in the non-staple foods, you have certain types of, of interventions. And I, I feel that there's so many things that we have to do to improve the productivity of non-staple food crops because we have to get those prices lower and lower over time, not higher and higher. We were able to reduce the cereal prices uh, over time, but we haven't, the, the non-staple food prices have gone in the other direction. And to me, that's our challenge if we want to, if we want to reduce undernutrition in a cost-effective way. So this is, my, uh, this is my final slide, and this is what I usually uh, use to introduce biofortification. So we now have this orange maze. Um, I would hope, and this is, this, is, this is no longer considered an innovation. It's too old now. It's too old an idea to be considered innovation. But, um, you know, my hope is that 20 years from now, most of, the, most of the maize in Africa is orange, and the young children will have forgotten that there used to be white maize. Um, carrots used to be white, and we've forgotten that. We only now think of, of carrots as orange and being high in vitamin A. But uh, my cautionary note is that these, these things take time, it takes perseverance, and you have to follow them up over a long period of time. I was very excited about this idea when I was 42, and I'm a little bit older than 42 now. Uh, it took 10 years to develop the funding. We couldn't do it without funding, and it took 10 years to convince, finally, the Gates Foundation give us, gave us the funding to get it started. Then it's taken another 15 years to get where we are today, where we have now 10 million farmers around the world growing biofortified crops. They're available in 35 countries. 
but we have another 20, 25 years before we realize our vision where most of the, most of the staple foods being grown in developing countries are biofortified. So you, you need excitement, you need passion, you need an idea, but it takes a long time. You need the perseverance as well. So thank you very much.